Hi, I'm Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Election. This video is part of my lean training system. It was originally released as a DVD a long time ago, but times have changed and the look of some of these LTS videos is now a bit dated. The content is still spot on though. So rather than just discontinue the line, I am posting the majority of each of the 36 videos here with the remainder available at Velaction Videos. That's our video service where you can download a wealth of supporting content and watch subscriber only videos. I recommend subscribing and hitting the notification button if you want to make sure you don't miss any new content. I would also really appreciate if you would hit the like button if this video is helpful and you want to see more content similar to it. The like button helps us get found on YouTube, but it also lets us figure out where you want us to put our future effort. Now enjoy the free version of this video. Welcome to Velaction Continuous Improvement's presentation on control charts. I am Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Velaction. I like to start all my videos by letting you know what I hope you get out of the time you are investing in learning. The first goal is to simply get a better understanding of what control charts are and the circumstances in which they should be used. Because this is an overview of control charts, I won't be getting into great detail on how to create the chart. There is a lot of higher level math involved, and the assumption is that you will have some skilled professionals who can put them together. We are focusing on frontline employees and managers who will use control charts to make decisions. Some of these decisions will be influenced by something known as special cause variation. Control charts are very helpful in isolating these types of problems from the normal random fluctuations of a process. If you've done a little bit of research on control charts, you probably know that there is a lot of statistics involved. For most people, the mere thought of this type of math sends them into a cold sweat. But let me try to give you an example to make it a little bit more fun. Imagine for a moment that we had a deck of cards. What would be the chance of drawing a three? For consistency, Let's assume aces have a value of 1 all the way up to the value of 13 for a king. When I teach this class live, I actually ask students to draw a card and mark the value up on a whiteboard. We return the card to the deck, shuffle, and let each student draw a card from a complete deck. When we put the results up on the board, the line is pretty flat because there is an even chance of drawing each card. So we understand drawing a single card gives us pretty even odds. If I asked you to bet on what the next card drawn would be, you might choose 5 because each card has the same probability of being drawn. But what if I dealt out 5 cards at a time and asked you to bet on what the average value would be? Would you still expect the result to be a 5? Or would you choose a different value that would be more likely? If you are intuitive, you would probably guess 7. Sure, on occasion you might get 4 aces and a 2, and once in a while you might choose all face cards. But more often than not, you'll have a range of values that will average out close to 7. I hope you are getting something valuable out of this video. If you want to get more out of this program, we recommend watching it on Velaction videos. You'll be able to watch the entire video, mostly ad-free, and view subscriber-only programs you'll also have access to a load of continuous improvement downloads. There's actually a mathematical principle behind the concept I just talked about. It is called the Central Limit Theorem. It basically says, when you average the results of the numbers drawn from any type of distribution, you get what's called a normal distribution. You might know this by its common name, the bell curve. And that is why, when you average the results of a random draw from a flat distribution between 1 and 13, you get 7 more frequently than any other number. So now, I am going to pose a hypothetical to you. Let's imagine that I went around the room and had you draw your poker hand and average it out. And we went around the room several times and got a nice normal distribution centered at 7. But the next time we went around, we noticed a strange phenomena the average hand was now coming out around 6. We know intuitively that the 6 means something is off. If we wanted to throw some more math at you, 
we would talk about standard deviations. You may be familiar with the term Six Sigma. Sigma is simply the annotation for standard deviation. A standard deviation is a measure of the spread of a data set. The smaller the standard deviation, the more pointy the bell curve will be. But the same percentage of points will fall under that standard deviation. In this diagram, you'll notice that 68.3% of all values should fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% will be within two standard deviations, and 99.7% will be within three standard deviations. As you can imagine, there are quite a few digits beyond the decimal point when you get out to six standard deviations. For six sigma, that means that six standard deviations from the mean should fall within the process specs. Basically, that means with six sigma quality, you can have only a few defects per million opportunities. But back to our control chart. If you start getting a lot of values stacking up where you don't expect them, you know something is wrong because the odds of that happening without something nudging the results is unlikely. So we've talked about what a bell curve is. Now let's show how it relates to control charts. Let's take the bell curve we just talked about and turn it on its side. Now let's put a control chart next to it. Basically, a control chart is a run chart with upper and lower control limits drawn into it. Typically, control charts are updated on a daily basis. They can be done more frequently, however. You simply add the data points each time the observation period ends. And you'll continue to do this over time. The result is similar to a run chart. The distinction from a run chart, though, is that a control chart will also have lines drawn at one and two standard deviations away from the mean. The control limits are three standard deviations from the mean. If you are an astute observer, you'll probably realize that this means you need to have some historical data available to compare the current data to. Essentially, this is the same as we did with the cards. We knew that our deck of cards would yield data centered around the value of seven. Similarly, there should also be an expected pattern of the data in the process we are monitoring. Now there's some pretty daunting math that goes into calculating the standard deviation of that data. Fortunately, in practice, most people using control charts will have a tool that you enter data into and it spits out the charts for you to monitor. Excel also has a function to calculate standard deviation. And there's even more good news. Generally, the quality or engineering team prepares the charts. Frontline team members just fill them out and monitor them. What are you monitoring for? Well, if we see a shift in the points, or an outlier as we see here, we know something is wrong. There are actually several more things to look for as we'll talk about later. In a nutshell, when we look for those shifts and other abnormalities, we are really looking for variation. And there are two main types of variation. The first is common cause variation or noise. The second is special cause variation. Common cause variation is the natural randomness of a system. If you think about an icicle dripping off the branch of a tree, there is a pattern of splashes in the snow on the ground. Most will be in a fairly tight grouping directly below the tip of the icicle. The higher up in the tree, the wider the grouping will be. But over time, the pattern will stay in pretty much the same area. The minor fluctuations in the drips are not easily attributed to anything in particular. For special cause, though, there are specific reasons you can point to. You can look at one drip far to the right and trace it back to a gust of wind. Another drip might have been from a squirrel jumping on a branch. The point is that there is something specific that caused each outlier. In your systems, though, that special cause might not be so easily identifiable. Another distinguishing factor is when the cause is present. Common cause is always there. The small variation is a constant presence. Special causes don't happen all the time. They come and go. Common causes are also more predictable than special causes, at least mathematically. That doesn't mean that you can't see a special cause in advance. It just means the data points don't fit the pattern. Now this point is a tough one for some people to get. 
actual randomness is very, very uncommon in nature. With a big enough microscope, we can typically isolate the little things that create common cause variation. With the icicle example, there are likely some air currents flowing around that are imperceptible. There may be some vibration from a nearby road. If we really wanted to, we could isolate and remove those things. In practical application though, we look at the things within the expected standard deviations as common cause. Let's talk now about when to use the control chart. One of the primary considerations when using a control chart is to make sure that you have a stable process before attempting to use it. Why is this? Think about what I was just saying about common cause versus special cause. If every aspect of your process is full of variation, all that randomness stacks up and creates a very large standard deviation. Basically, it is like drawing your poker hand from a different set of cards each time rather than a complete deck. The central limit theorem wouldn't work because there is no single distribution you are drawing from. Essentially, when your entire data set is based on chaos, no special chaos will stand out. So you want to reduce variation as much as possible before doing control charts on your process. That makes changes stand out much better. So why not just use a run chart once a process is stable? You would be correct in assuming that once you stabilize your process, big problems will stand out like a sore thumb. It stands to reason that they would also show up as a spike on your run chart. The benefit of a control chart versus a run chart is that it is more sensitive to small changes. Little shifts in your process, such as machines slowing down, will show up in your control chart long before they become visible to the naked eye. Let's dive into the steps that you will take when developing your control chart. As I mentioned, you need some historical data and a somewhat stable process as a prerequisite for creating a control chart. As I also mentioned, there is some substantial math embedded into control charts. Fortunately, it is a relatively simple task to find a tool that will do the math for you. Still, you probably want your control charts developed by somebody with a little more training than you can get from watching a short video. Your manufacturing engineering team or your quality team probably has at least a few people who fit the bill to set your charts up. And of course, once the math is done, make the charts. One common technique is to post the control chart on the shop floor where the process is being done. It is completely acceptable to hand write the data points onto the formatted control chart. Some people do prefer to have the control chart posted online though. As part of the lean training system this video comes from, we offer a variety of lean Lego training packages. These include our Lean Lego Flow Simulation, Mistake Proofing or Pokey Oak Lean Lego Exercise, and our Visual Controls and 5S Lean Lego Exercise. We've also got an Office Flow Simulation for those not implementing continuous improvement on the shop floor. Click the links in the description below or click on cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. The type of chart that you choose to do will determine your data collection plan. Make sure you're clear on how you want the data collected. Variations in the data collection process will show up on your control chart. That will make you start chasing shadows. Be sure that all operators that will be reporting data are trained in the process. Once you have your control charts developed, monitor them. And be sure to actually do something when your control chart shows that something is amiss. Far too often, the leadership team sets up a great system to identify problems, but does nothing with the information. Okay, up until now, I've been talking about the data points as if each was a single piece of information. In truth, the data that you are recording is actually an average of several samples that you take. It might be the average diameter of a part that comes off a lathe each day or it might be the average cycle time for station 12 on your assembly line, taken at two hour intervals. Why is this? Remember when I mentioned the central limit theorem? It requires that we compare averages. The term X bar simply means average of the sample. Now this is not the only type of control chart. 
is just the most common. Again, I recommend that you have somebody with expertise in control charts manage your process. They will make the decisions about what type of control chart to use and the best way to create it. That person will also have to determine how big of a sample you will be averaging out and how often you will be posting that number. So let's say that this is the data that you collected. There are certain things that you will be looking for, knowing that because you're comparing averages, there is an expected normal distribution. In this case, there is a trend. You are looking for six or more points going in the same direction. This control chart is still okay though, because the sixth point reversed course. If it had kept going up, we would probably suspect that there is an ongoing change that is causing a problem. This might be indicative of a machine wearing out and getting worse over time. That is somewhat different from this situation in which a series of nine or more points all lies on the same side of the average. This indicates that there is likely a change in the process. In this situation, the shift was temporary as it returned to the normal pattern. In many cases, the shift is permanent. And don't think of the shift as always bad. If we conducted a Kaizen event, we want to see this shift. If you are taking measurements of a part diameter though, the shift is nearly always a problem. The difference between these two slides is that a trend is an ongoing incremental change, a shift is a one-time change in the process. Take a brief look at this chart. Thanks for watching this extended free version of our Lean Training System module video. If you want to watch the whole video, check it out at Velaction Videos. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next LTS video that we post, please be sure to subscribe down below. We also always appreciate likes as it helps us get viewed more and makes us keep adding additional content. Thanks for watching and best wishes on your continuous improvement journey.